And how do we choose the right path? How will we know which way is the one that is marked out for us?
and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. Lord, help our hearts to hear you say, come and talk with me. Help our hearts to hear you say, because God, I know that when we hear your voice say, come and talk with me, when we just hear it, when we, when we catch your heart for us, God, I know that that's when our hearts will say, yes, I will come. I'll come and talk with you. But God, I am sorry for the times that I've missed hearing your heart say, come and talk with me. I ask your forgiveness, God. I ask your forgiveness, God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because who am I 
that the God of heaven should be standing there saying, will you come and talk with me? And that I should be running around so busy that I miss your voice, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are who you say you are, a God of mercy, a God so patient, a God overflowing with unfailing love for us, that you continue and in this very moment, you're saying it again. Come and talk with me. And yes, Lord, my heart responds. Our hearts respond. Amen. We will come and talk with you. We want to hear your voice. We don't want to miss what you have for us, God. You're everything we need. You're everything we've ever needed. You're everything we've ever needed. And we go searching for answers, searching for rest, searching for fulfillment, running, running but in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, you gotta be close enough. You, got, you gotta be close enough. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore.
just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else.
Father God, we come before you this morning. God, there's a very unique feeling of your presence this morning. Your spirit is moving through this room, God. And we ask you to continue to flow through this room and flow through this service, Lord. Jesus, help us as your people, as your church, to have a heart posture of worship, to want to facilitate the atmosphere so that you can do what you need to do in our lives, so that you can bring healing, so that you can bring deliverance, so that you can break the chains in our lives that only you can break. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your resurrection, God. We thank you for being who you are. You are so great. You are so mighty. You are so powerful. Renew us, Lord. Give us a French, a, a fresh sense of your presence. Fill your people. God, on Friday nights, on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings, let your spirit flow through this church. Let it never just be songs we just sing, but let our songs be used to as an offering of worship. Let our lives be an offering of worship because we know worship is more than a song. It's a daily walk. So God, we thank you. We thank you for this morning. God, I ask you to bless Pastor Dan. God, help him deliver the word that you have for your people this morning. And bless the time that we have together. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. And I'd like to share with you today a message which is entitled, Joy in God's Presence. In just a moment, we're going to consider Psalm 16 and verse 11, and I'd encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. But first, I'd just like to share with you something funny. I thought that if we're talking about joy, it might be good to have a little smile that comes and that hits us. And I want you to know that sometimes we will get lost. I don't know whether you've ever gotten lost, and I thought of many ways that we could communicate that. And, and I thought about husbands, you know, who don't like to ask directions, and I thought about wives, and I thought, no, 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 let's not beat up on the guys today, and, and let's be gentle with the women as well. So I thought, let's talk about the dogs, amen. So there's a lost dog who has strayed into the jungle. And as this lost dog has gone into the jungle, he happens to be noticed by a lion who is looking at him from a distance with specific focus. And the lion says to himself, he says, this dog, and he didn't really know to call it a dog, but he said, this animal looks edible, but I have never seen his kind before. So the lion starts running towards the dog with evil intention. And the dog notices. And the dog begins to panic. The dog is lost. But as he is about to turn and run, the dog sees some bones next to him. And being a dog, being a little smarter... He says loudly, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. That was some good lion meat. At which the fast-approaching lion abruptly stops. 
and says, whoa, this guy seems a little tougher than he looks. I better leave while I can. Over by the treetop, a monkey witnesses the whole thing. And evidently, the monkey realizes that he can benefit from this situation by telling the lion and by getting something in return. And so the monkey proceeds to tell the lion what really happened. And the lion angrily says, get on my back because we are going to get that dog together. And so they start rushing back to the dog. The dog sees them. And because the dog is smart, he realized what happened. And panic hits him even more. But then he gets another idea. And now he lifts up his voice and as loud as he can, he says, where is that monkey? I told him more than an hour ago to bring me another lion. <laughs> I want you to know that being lost is something that all of us can experience because every road has its twists and turns. Every path has its unseen dangers and unexpected surprises. And life is no different. There is great uncertainty in our world. We've talked a little bit about that uncertainty. Right now, we know that economically, the markets are trembling. We know that the real estate market is wondering what is going to happen. And in the midst of that, we have students that are preparing for a new school year. They've just completed some of them, summer school, so that they might get an advanced start, get ready for what's in store in the fall. But they're wondering, which path should I follow? And so the question for each of us today is simply this. What course will our lives navigate in the days ahead? And I encourage each one to follow God through every twist and turn, through the sudden sadness, through the confusing fear, through the surprising joy, and through overwhelming anxiety. Let's learn to trust God. Because life is full of unexpected moments. Yet it's God's promises that help us navigate the course. So as we find ourselves in Psalm 16 and verse 11, let's read it together, and then we're going to talk about it. It says this, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. I'd suggest to you that in this psalm, we can see three amazing assurances that are giving, given to us. And so God desires to speak to us from his word. And what does he have to say? Well, firstly, we can see that God himself will show us the way of life. Now, this is important for us to understand that God wants to show us the way of life. Often we go to many sources and we, and we look for many paths of counsel or a variety of voices that would be speaking to us. But the most important voice that we are able to discern in our lives is the very voice of God. Because God has a path for us, and he wants to identify it to us. Notice that when the psalmist identifies the path of life, that he identifies it as being singular and not plural. Did you notice that? It doesn't say that, that God will lead us in the paths of life. 
as if each one of us are individual and there are multiple paths. No, I'd suggest that there are not multiple paths of life as God describes it, but there is only one way of life, and that way of life is through Jesus Christ. It's John 14 and verse 6 that says this, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. You know, we live in a society where, where so many times we, we hold to the idea of tolerance, even religious tolerance. And we believe that it's okay no matter what you believe as long as you sincerely believe. I want you to know there is something about sincerity of belief. And certainly we don't want a church that is filled with individuals who don't truly believe that Jesus is the way. But I want you to know that the only sincere belief that matters is the one that identifies Jesus as the only way. We believe in the absolute truth. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 10 and verse 9, he said, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. Ultimately, God wants us on the way of life. And he wants us to be able to find Jesus as the gate. But there aren't multiple pathways to God. It's not a matter of every road leads to Rome. It's a matter of the way of destruction being broad and the way of life being narrow. And blessed are those who find it. And so we can walk on that way that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And we cannot begin the journey without first coming to Christ. Catch that, very important. Jesus is not only the way, but Jesus is also the gate. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. And so it's important to remember that our first point identifies that God wants to direct our path and to guide our life. Contrary to what many have been taught over the years, God is not aloof nor distant from us. God is not indifferent or unresponsive. In fact, I'd suggest that he is right here, right now. And he desires to show you the path. The psalmist clearly states, you will show me the way of life. And so it's not a matter of whether God will do his part. The question is, is whether we will walk in God's direction for our lives or not. Whether we will surrender our will to his. Whether we will um, identify with all that he has for us? That's the question. For most, life provides us with a plethora of paths that we could choose or ways that we could follow in. But the question is, which way is the best way? And how do we choose the right path? How will we know which way is the one that is marked out for us? And what criteria will we use to determine the course of our lives? Well, some consider in the place of key decision-making, they ask themselves the question, does it feel good? Some say, you know, will it bring me prosperity or financial benefit? Others wonder whether it will bring fame or recognition or popularity. Still others wonder whether it will make me happy. There are some that question, will my friends or my family approve? 
And I can understand this method of decision-making that has us asking key questions along the way. But the most important question that we can ask is, does this decision line up with God's word and what God has in store for me? Can you say amen to that? And we need to be careful because not every path leads us to the place of life. In fact, Proverbs 16 and verse 25 cautions us. It says, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. So what seems right is not always right. And what feels right is not always right. We can't trust the way that we think nor the way that we feel. But what we can trust in is in the principles of God's word. They are timeless, they are proven, and they endure forever. And they show us God's way. And God's way is always right. And his truth is absolute. And so we need to look for the way of life that God will show us, and we need to stay on it. So God shows us the path of life from his word. In fact, the Bible itself, Psalm 119, and we spent a couple weeks on it, says this. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want you to know that God will clearly light the path for you. And the question is not whether he lights the path. The question is whether you're prepared to follow in that pathway. How many of you know that there are many that prefer to walk in darkness and you can't blame God because that is a choice and a decision that you have made. God has shown us very clearly the path of life. And the question is, is whether we will follow it. But some would say, Pastor, I get a little nervous about walking on God's path. I get a little nervous because it doesn't seem like in this society in which we live that there are many that are walking this pathway. It seems like all my friends are headed in one direction, and so I'm kind of pulled and torn in that direction. I want you to know that each one of us is responsible for the individual decisions that we make. And there are times where when we decide to follow Jesus, that we remember that even in that classic hymn, there's a verse that says, though none Go with me. Still, I will follow. How many of you know that there is a church family that wants to walk with you? There is a church family that wants to support you. There is a church family that wants to bear you up in their arms. And there is a church family that wants to encourage you. That doesn't mean that when you give your life to Christ, that everybody around you is going to follow on that same path means that there are times where we need to pray and we need to say, Lord, the same work that you did in me, would you do it within my friends? Would you do it within my family? In the meantime, help me to make decisions that, you know, direct them towards the pathway that you are leading me on. Lord, help me to follow you. And secondly, as we look at what we can glean from Psalm 16 and verse 11, we can see that on the way of life, we do not walk alone because God is with us. Some would say, Pastor, seriously, that's in that verse? Yes, it is. And we'll see where in just a moment. But let me first of all bring the greater counsel of the scripture that says that God has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Can anyone say amen? Amen. 
And that's a powerful truth, so it doesn't matter what we encounter along our journey, as long as we know that his presence is with us. And there are times where he will deliver us from the mouth of the lion, and there are some times that he'll deliver us from the lion's den. But sometimes we go through an experience where we sense his presence in a way like we've never known it before, but he's brought us through. And we can thank the Lord because he is faithful. And his presence makes a difference in our lives. His presence strengthens us in times of weakness. His presence guides us in times of indecision. His presence, the presence of the Lord, comforts us in times of grief and loss. His presence assures us in times of great uncertainty. His presence empowers us in moments of doubt. And it's his presence that is powerful. But his presence, according to the psalmist, grants us joy. God grants me the joy of his presence. Think about that for a moment. Joy is not found in an abundance of things. It's not found in bigger houses, cars, or bank accounts. It is not found in public recognition, higher status, or in moving up the corporate ladder. We often spend much of our time chasing after things only to be left unsatisfied, empty, and burdened with more once we catch them. I want you to know that the more that you have, the more that you're responsible for. The more responsibility you have, the greater the pressure you have. And so in our desire for more, We often forget that more leads to more. And so the happiness or the joy isn't going to come from those things. I'd suggest that rather it's deep down inside each one of us that there is a yearning for something that goes beyond this life and that comes to us only through Jesus Christ. In fact, I'd suggest that real joy is found only in Jesus. And what our hearts seek and long for can be found in a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In his presence, there is fullness of joy, and we can find it but we could be in his presence and miss out on the very joy that he has for us. See, we've been created to be in relationship with God, to have fellowship with him, and he promises never to leave us nor forsake us. But along life's journey, even as we're walking the way of life, there are things that can hit us. There are things that could set us back. There are things that could cause us great anxiety and fear. But if we don't learn, if we could learn this concept of choosing the joy that is found in his presence, then we can experience a peace that passes understanding. I'd suggest to you that some of the greatest saints of God that I've ever met are not individuals who have not gone through struggle, but are individuals who have gone through and come through on the other side with a testimony. They've experienced the test, but they've come out with a testimony. Can anybody say amen to that? And so the good news is, is that there is a relationship that matters so much to God that he desires to have with us that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this world to live and to die. 
and to conquer the grave so that we might be reconciled or brought back into right relationship with God. It's John 10 in verse 10, the latter half that says this, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I want you to know that you can have life and not only life, but you can have it more abundant. You can experience a joy in Jesus Christ that is unlike anything that you have ever experienced or anything that this world has ever known or anything that money could buy. It's a joy that is based on our, not on our circumstances, but on our relationship with God. When we understand that he loves us, And we can say, oh, how he loves us. Oh, there's something that happens. And then we say it again, how he loves us, how he loves us all. And as we live our lives following God's way of life, we can enjoy the constant abiding presence of God and the joy that comes from our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Our relationship has us looking forward to anticipate with joy all that is in store for us in eternity. And that's where the psalmist moves. Because while our way of life may feel incomplete and imperfect, God's way of life leads us to an eternity in heaven that will be perfect in every way. The Bible assures us in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, it says God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in our hearts. Think about that for a moment. Is everything beautiful? Everything that you've gone through, is it beautiful? Probably not. But the Bible says that God has made all things beautiful. And so what do we need? We need a little bit of the synergy that can happen when two different components that are perhaps not tolerable nor beneficial on their own come together Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen being highly unstable. But when you bring hydrogen in one part and two parts of oxygen, you have water. And there's a tremendous benefit in water. It's a source of life for us. It's synergy. And I want you to know that when synergy happens and, and, and you bring different components together, then we can testify to the truth of Scripture that says that all things, doesn't say some things, doesn't say most things, it says all things, can you finish it with me? All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and those who are called in accordance with his purpose. So I want you to know that in your life, all things can be good. They might not start good, but they can be good. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Who can say all things? all things? Can anybody else say all things? All things. All things. All things. And we need to have that hit our spirits. And I want us to know that ultimately... We find ourselves in the place of heaven in number three from Psalm 16 and verse 11. God's way of life leads us to the pleasures of living with him forever. Now, make no mistake. God's pleasures are forever. And this phrase stands in direct contrast to the scripture that says that the pleasures of sin are fleeting and they are temporary and they last but for a season. And that's what Hebrews 11.25 says. But it says that the pleasures of God are for how long? They are for ever. 
And we need to allow that to get into our souls as well, that God has something for us forever. And he offers us the assurance of a pleasure-filled eternity with him through Jesus Christ. And so this is a direct reference in the Psalms to heaven. And heaven is real. Heaven is not a figment of our imagination. It is not something that we have contrived to be a crutch for us to lean on. No, heaven is real. Have you ever heard of Lee Strobel? Former award-winning news reporter and someone who was an atheist who became a Christian pastor, author, and apologist on his journey towards faith. He ended up writing a book or researching for a book that really the title of it was changed and it became The Case for Christ. And this book, The Case for Christ, is one that all of us should read at one point or another. It will only strengthen our faith. There's a movie that provides a short synopsis of it, and uh, it's powerful as well. I'd encourage you to consider it, but, but the case for Christ came as a result of countless hours of research done by Lee Strobel as he was intending to disprove Christianity and expose Jesus Christ as a hoax or as a myth. And so he researched the facts, and when faced with the facts, he ended up coming face to face with the resurrected Christ and with the power of Jesus' love, and he was transformed in heart and in mind. Anyways, he has gone on to research many other things having to do with our faith and our belief system, including heaven and life after death. He has interviewed many individuals who have experienced, you know, the loss of breath where it appeared that they have breathed their last breath only to miraculously be given another breath. And in spite of being prescribed as clinically dead with no heartbeat, no brain waves, no breath, no vital signs, Though they were clinically dead, they were not irreversibly dead. And they came back with stories that are difficult to fathom. Now, this is quite a concept for us to wrap our minds around. And so I share what Lee Strobel declared. He said, my favorite case is of a woman named Maria who died in the hospital. And she said later that, yeah, I know I was declared dead, but I was conscious the whole time. And she said, my spirit separated from my body, and I was watching the resuscitation efforts on my body, and my spirit floated out It went through the ceiling and out of the hospital. And she said, when I was revived, my spirit rejoined my body. And then she said to the people in the hospital, she said, by the way, there's a man's tennis shoe on the roof of the hospital. It is left-footed. It is dark blue. It's a man's shoe. It's got a little war, wear rather, over the uh, little toe, and the shoelaces are tucked in under the heel. You can imagine what the feeling was in that room. When someone was sent up to the roof and came back a couple minutes later with that shoe 
in their hands, finding it exactly as she had said. Whew. How do you explain any of that? How does that fit into our human understanding? How does it fit into our biblical understanding? Ultimately, I really don't know. But there are countless stories like that that are difficult for us to comprehend on one hand, but they can't be reasoned away on the other. And so I read those accounts with wide-eyed wonder, but I don't place my faith in the experiences of people Rather, I prefer to tether to the truth of the Holy Scriptures and secure my belief to its sacred words. And so here I am today to declare to you that heaven is a place of pleasures forevermore. That's what the Bible says. We just read it. So that means that it will be devoid of all sorrow and sin, and it will be full of awe and wonder. It will be a place where grace and peace reign totally unchallenged. Heaven is where every true treasure and every eternal reward is laid up for the redeemed. It is beyond human comprehension what the Lord has in store for us. Wow. It was the late Keith Green, a radical and revolutionary worship leader and Christian artist whose ministry came to my attention during the North American Jesus movement of the 70s, who first challenged me to think of the majesty of eternal glory in heaven in a way like I had never thought of it before. Keith Green said something like this. In the midst of one of his songs, he bust out with the phrase, Jesus created everything that there is in six days, and he rested on the seventh. But now, and then he laughed. He's been working on heaven 2,000 years. How many know that heaven is going to be a wonderful place? But heaven is an actual place, and it is prepared and designed for the redeemed, for all of those who have accepted God's free gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, in John 14 and verses 1 to 3, the words of Jesus are recorded. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. So heaven is a place that Jesus is preparing for you and me. For all of the saints of all of the ages, heaven is a place of beauty. It's a place of peace. It's a place of constant health and happiness. It is filled with people from all the earthly ages who have one thing in common, and that is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How many know that sacrifice of the Old Testament, of the Lamb? Deliverance only comes if you apply the blood of the Lamb. But when that blood is applied, you and your household are set free. Can anybody say amen to that? And so we need to learn to apply the blood of the Lamb into our lives. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. 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 The devil is defeated by one, tr one drop of blood. There are great things that can happen in our lives. He has great things in store for us. And oh, how wonderful heaven will be. And we just read as God's word affirmed that there are pleasures that are found in the presence of God that endure forever. I want you to know that the idea of forever offers us permanency. 
You will never again suffer the threat of eviction. You will never again have somebody that comes and expropriates your space. No, in heaven, you are secure forever in the presence of the Lord. And those pleasures of heaven are pleasures that our minds cannot conceive nor imagine. It is incredible what the Lord has in store for each one of us. What it looks like, I don't know. But what I do know is that my Bible tells me that there will be no more sin. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more separation. No parting over there. There will be no grief and no sorrow. Why? Because all is peace and joy forevermore in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And Scripture tells us that in that day that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Wow. As expansive as heaven is, it's also personal, Jesus and me. God himself will wipe away every tear. So I want you to know he's the one who mends the heartaches. He's the one who takes the broken pieces and he puts it together and he makes all things new. He's the one who takes the ruined lives and he restores them in his presence forever. Oh, I really just want to see you there. I can think of so many that I've prayed for. I can think of individuals that I'm praying for right now that I want to see in heaven. I'm praying that they would choose to walk on God's way of life and that they would choose to come through the gate of our Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know who I really want to see the most? I can imagine that my preoccupation would likely be to see the one whose glory fills that amazing place, the one who died for me, the one who tasted death so that I might live. Oh, the old song says it so poignantly. Listen to this. I dreamed of a city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I entered the gates, I cried, holy. The angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights that I saw. But I said, I want to see Jesus, the one who died for all. So then I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. 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 I clapped my hands and sang glory, glory to the Son of God. And as I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven. Such scenes were too many to tell. I saw Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac talked with Mark and Timothy, but I said, I want to see Jesus because he's the one who died for me. So then I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. I clapped my hands and sang glory, Glory, glory. I clapped my hands and sang glory. I clapped my hands and sang glory. Glory to the Son of God. I sang glory to the Son of God. Come on, can you clap your hands? And can we say glory, glory, glory. Oh, I want to see Jesus. Oh, I want to see Jesus, my Savior, and my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But to see Jesus as our heavenly Savior and Lord, to be able to see him someday in heaven, we must ask him to be our earthly Lord and Savior today. The decision is ours as to what we would do with Jesus. We must believe or embrace what the Bible says. We must trust and receive Jesus into our hearts. The Bible says to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. The Bible also says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So here is how you can accept Jesus into your life. Firstly, admit your need. Say, Jesus, I'm coming just as I am. I'm a sinner. And then be willing to turn from your sins. Lord, I desire to change. Forgive me. I repent of my sins. Then thirdly, believe that Jesus died for you on the cross and that he rose again from the dead. Be saved by faith. And then fourthly, through prayer, invite Jesus to come and take control of your life by the Holy Spirit. Receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. And so, why not ask Jesus to be your Savior today? Why not assure your place in heaven, even by praying this prayer after me? I'd invite us, why don't we repeat these words out loud and make them your very own and mean them from the bottom of your heart. Let's pray, dear Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask you for forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sin, that you paid the price for all my wrongdoings, and that God raised you to life. I believe that you have opened a way To heaven for me so now I want to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward guide me on the way of life help me to do God's will I pray this in Jesus mighty name amen and amen. And I invite you all across this place and those at home, let's stand together and let's join in this great song of conclusion. <laughs>